is Luke Bernfeld, and I will be talking to you about input methodology as it relates to game history. Video game input is core to gaming experience, uh, also to the development of video games, and uh, is really the only way you can play video games. Without an input method, you have a movie. Sadly, when we talk about input methodology with uh, games, we focus on digital games and we also focus on console games uh, without really paying attention to the input methodologies of analog games and PC games, which are important uh, but different than what you would traditionally find in console inputs. This is Space War uh, for the PDP-1. It was developed at MIT, and the input method for this is this little guy, which has a toggle to move left and right, uh, another toggle to thrust and to warp, uh, and then the button, which shoots the projectiles at the other player. And there would be two, and they would play together uh, on the same very small screen. Missile Command is an arcade title from uh, the early arcade era of video games. The difference between Missile Command and a lot of other arcade games is that the way that you moved around the cursor uh, to aim the missiles that you're seeing launched from these different things uh, was a trackball, uh, and it allowed the player to rapidly uh, choose where they were firing and, and fire. And then you had three buttons that were used to fire the different projectiles um, at the enemies and also the missiles uh, of the game. Yar's Revenge released on the Atari 2600, and the Atari's controller uh, is a little bit different in it was trying to mimic arcade inputs. So you have the joystick and then the single button. Uh, and with that joystick and single button, there was all the interaction that you could do within the game, um, making games like Yours Revenge or any other Atari game uh, quite simplistic in their input of capabilities. This is Rampage for the Nintendo Entertainment System. This game's input method is the NES controller. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen it, it is four buttons. Um, and then you have uh, a directional pad. So this input shifted from arcade sticks in an attempt to replicate what was in arcades and moved on to uh, a directional pad um, which was useful for more precise movements within a platforming space uh, so think about things like um, super mario brothers or even rampage where you're wanting to jump from thing to thing and be precise with those movements the directional pad offered um, much more precision than an arcade stick did. This is Alter Beast for the Sega Genesis. The um, inputs for the Genesis are similar to the inputs for the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo controller had shoulder buttons um, and the Genesis controller uh, initially, uh, only had four buttons, including the start button, uh, but then there was a seven-button variant released um, to complement fighting games and to allow players um, the additional inputs on certain games that, that utilize those. This is Mario Kart for the Nintendo 64. Uh, and the Nintendo 64 uh, controller is one of the more 
unique controllers uh, in gaming history. It mapped a lot to one analog stick. Uh, it brought the analog stick back uh, into the gaming space, um, allowing for um, more movement options for the player. Um, it maintained about the same number of buttons, uh, adding just a few more. But uh, the biggest thing that it added was the thumbstick. Uh, but its design was um, unique, to say the least. And uh, the proper way to hold it, I love this, is this image. Um, just fun. This is Warcraft 2, a game on the PC where you used keyboard and mouse inputs. The, as I said earlier, the keyboard and mouse are frequently overlooked as input methodologies when uh, people look at and study those, um, but they're important uh, and they have evolved just like uh, any others. This is um, an image of a IBM M1 keyboard and a 90s mouse because they would be what you would use to play something like Warcraft 2. So I'd like to show you some examples of gameplay using different input methodologies as a way to demonstrate how they're important and also how coding to those uh, input methodologies alters the way that games function and play. So this is GoldenEye for the N64, uh, which was coded to that controller I showed earlier, where movement and um, aiming were mapped to the one analog stick. Um, and then you had the ability to fire with the right trigger and then as you're seeing here with me zooming in uh, once you did push the zoom button then the analog you was used to aim the reticle around um, and it was not precise um, and it because of that lack of precision it was coded so that there would be delay on when enemies would fire at you there would be um, uh, aim assist help there was different things to help the player uh play and get through the game without too much in now for this playthrough i used a um hack which made makes the game keyboard and mouse mapped uh, and as you can tell already there is far more fluidity to what I'm doing. Um, it is much easier to aim at and move through the space. Um, firing at enemies becomes easier because those delays, this base code has not been altered. Uh, all that was altered is the graphical fidelity um, and the input mapping to a keyboard and mouse allowing for strafing, allowing for precise aiming, allowing for the player to move through the space more fluidly. But because of the coding of the original game, it just becomes shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, the AI isn't designed to have a player have the capacity to aim at it, aim at it fire and strafe simultaneously uh, with that level of fidelity. Now, the next examples are from uh, Wolfenstein 3D. And this is an example of a very early PC shooter. Uh, and this first clip is me playing through the first level um, using or part of the first level, using uh, the keyboard and mouse controls. And the mouse integration at that period in games was 
not very good. As you can see, this is me having to hold multiple buttons in order to strafe. Uh, the idea of strafing, the idea of aiming using a mouse hadn't really uh, come into its own yet. And so uh, a lot of games used uh, a similar movement pattern that you'd find in Goldeneye, where the player moves and then uh, is able to aim and shoot using arrow keys, the arrow keys and a couple buttons. This is the same level, but in VR. Uh, so someone had ported the entirety of Wol the first episode of Wolfenstein 3D into the VR space. And so because of that, there's some interactions and interaction styles that were not in the original game. Uh, unlike the mod of GoldenEye 64, this was coded uh, from the ground up by the people who uh, made this, meaning that uh, player interaction, AI, enemy AI, all of that is designed uh, for the player to be interacting using uh, VR inputs. It makes the motion a lot smoother. Um, and then the player is also able to um, interact in, in the space in a new and uh, interesting way. But without the uh, feeling that you are overpowered that you get with... Um, the golden eye uh, inputs. So after exploring all these different inputs and the way the input matters and the way the input inf affects development, play, interaction, in these spaces, uh, it's important to remember um, what that means for game history, what does that mean for preserving game history, uh, and how all that kind of ties together. And ultimately, it's important to preserve the games, and it's important to preserve the process and, and the ways that we see these games but it's also important to recognize uh, the input designed for them. Um, so when you're looking at game history, when you're looking at uh, important games throughout gaming history, um, it really is important to examine how you're playing them and how, and how the original inputs impacted the way that you saw the game, the way that you played the game, the way that you felt uh, about the game. Uh, playing games now without um, on console, without that haptic feedback that you get, uh, alters the way that you see the game. Um, and in, in some cases, input is core to the experience. Um, things like VR, you need those motion controllers, you need that headset, you need to have all of the different um, gyroscopes that are involved in that to really have that experience. Um, so looking back at uh, classic NES games, having those classic inputs um, is so important in, in recognizing what they were and how they functioned and how uh, that input really drove the experience and so uh really this this is um just an examination of what that is and how that's important how um those inputs and those those ways of experiencing are core to that um that game and uh should be talked about when, when we discuss uh, digital games and we discuss the history of games. So we should also uh, remember what those, those inputs were and what they were like. <laughs> 